Okay, let's continue with week two and start delving into some of the problems with threads that we encounter because of this non-deterministic behavior and the fact that they can share objects, they can share the state of different objects across multiple threads. So the problems we get specifically are race conditions and deadlocks. And we'll talk about race conditions in this particular section and deadlocks in the next one. But the source of these problems is the, pro the issues that you saw in the previous um, module. Basically non-deterministic behavior and you get these random interleavings of statements which can create undesirable effects, make your code unsafe as it's called. So the first problem is shared variables, shared states. So when multiple independent threads make changes to the same variable or the same object at the same time, what happens is at the machine level, you read a value from memory into a register on the CPU. You then change that value in the register and write the register value back, the modified value back to memory. So these at the machine level, if you were writing an assembly language, are all actually independent instructions. A read, change, write is not an atomic operation. It doesn't behave as a single operation at the machine level. So in this example here, very simple, we have thread one, which does an X equals X plus six, and thread two does X equals X plus one. And you'd hope that the result would be you know, X plus seven, but it may not be. Why? Well. In this case, we see that the two threads don't interleave. They're completely independent, non-overlapping in this particular execution scenario. So here we read X into a register in thread one. We had six and we write it back. All good, so we now have X plus six. Thread two sees the updated version. It reads it into the register, adds one, writes back, and everything's absolutely wonderful. What about this scenario? The thread one reads the value, it adds six when it's stored in its register. However, at that stage, it gets context switched. Thread two begins. It reads the original value of X into its register, adds one to it and writes it back. And then it's happy, it's finished. Uh, but thread two resumes, thread one, sorry, resumes and then writes back the value that it read from memory. So here we've got a race condition. The value is not what we expect it to be. It's actually gonna be X plus six, and this value is gonna, this update is going to be lost. So when threads share values um, in this sort of uncontrolled fashion, we will get race conditions, we will lose so a race condition means we have the same program, but when we execute it multiple times, we get different results. And the results that we get depend on the way that the CPU decides to, to schedule the execution of our threads and this way the statements interleave. As you can probably imagine, these are extremely hard to debug because they're not reproducible. They can produce different results. Sometimes they'll produce the right results in many cases, they'll produce the right results most of the time, but just occasionally you'll get an incorrect result. So because of this, they're really nasty to debug and really unpleasant if you let them occur in a production system. So the root cause of, is non-determinism. Sequential programs don't have this problem because they execute deterministically but race conditions are caused by non-deterministic behavior when accessing shared states. And the solution is we have to actually impose some ordering on this non-deterministic um, execution so that our code executes correctly and gives us the right results. So let's see how we do this. We do this using synchronization primitives. Here's a very simple example of some code that we'll show you in a second gives a race condition. 
So here we have a number of threads that we're going to execute, and there's just a single uh, method here called ink. And all this does is add one to the counter. Okay, very simple. In main, we create n num threads threads, and we do this in this example using a lambda. So we can use a lambda because this particular um, thread object only has a single method. So lambdas work really, really nicely. It's a very uh, nice shorthand for very simple threads. So here we're saying we're going to execute uh, num threads. So here 100,000. And basically we have a runnable, which is just going to execute counter.inc as its run method. And we create this thread and start it. So this is executing a thread every time we go around this loop, and that thread is just going to call ink. So if you think about it, we've got 100,000 threads. We execute ink once per thread. You should be able to guess what the value is going to be. We wait at the end, very crude wait, and then print out the result. So what do we get? Well, you can do it. You can run this yourself by looking at the code examples in the, the repository. But when I run it, I first of all get this result. So I've lost 12 updates. Then I run it again, and I've lost 10 updates. If I run it again, it'll probably be a different value. And if you run this yourself, you will see that we are we have a race condition. We are losing updates to our counter. So this is bad. We're getting the same program running multiple times, producing different results. Not a good situation to be in. So threads, if you're not careful with controlling access to shared variables, can be really, really nasty things. So how do we do get rid of these race conditions? There's a mechanism to do this called locking. And a lock imposes an ordering constraint on the execution of statements. So what we do is when we have shared variables which can be accessed by multiple threads at the same time, we ensure that only one of them can access that shared resource. Basically, we serialize the access to the shared resource. We do this by putting a lock around it. If you think about it, it's like a, a key mechanism. We go to the lock, we put the key in, it gives us access to what's inside. We can change the variable and then when we finish, we go out and lock the thing, release the lock so someone else can take the key and go in and, and make a change. So every time we wish to access a shared variable in a thread, we grab a lock, we change the variable. Well, we, we have the lock, no one else can go in there and then we release the lock. So if the lock is set, all other threads wait for it to be released. So let's assume there's 10 threads trying to access this shared variable. One thread gets in there and it's doing its thing, doing the updates, and nine others suddenly arise saying, I want to access this shared variable. What happens is because the lock has been acquired by a single thread, then all these other nine threads will wait. And which one will proceed next is determined by the JVM scheduler or the operating system schedule, depending on your language. It's not something you control. It's not something you can assume that they arrive and, are, they arrive and uh, are dispatched in a FIFO order, for example. So everything is sort of non-deterministic, apart from the fact that you know that you are serializing access to the shared variable through the lock. But you do this really simply in Java using a synchronized keyword on a method. So this says that this method can only be executed by one thread at a time. If multiple threads call ink at the same time, they will block while one completes. When it exits the, when it enters the, the method, it acquires the lock, it increments the count, and when it exits the method, it releases the lock so that another method can come in. And if you look in the code examples, there's a an example which um, has fixed this problem by adding the synchronized code to the example you saw earlier. And you can run it as many times as you want and you'll get the correct result. So Java synchronized methods, um, you basically put them on 
all the methods within a, a shared object. So here we have um, synchronized methods for incrementing and decrementing our shared counter here. And so this will ensure that the value is always correct. These are known as critical sections. Um, it's, and it's basically not possible for two invocations of synchronized methods on the same object to interleave. So only one thread can be executing the synchronized method on a particular object. This is implemented using something called monitor locks. So in underneath the covers in the Java virtual machine, every Java object is associated with a monitor. And when a thread uh, accesses a, a shared object through a synchronized method, it basically acquires this monitor lock. So a thread calls a met synchronized method on an object, it acquires the monitor lock. If another thread tries to call any method on that particular object, it can't because somebody else already holds the monitor lock on that particular object. So this means all the threads that are trying to call this particular method will this a method on this particular shared object with synchronized methods will block until the the executing thread completes the method and releases the lock. So the monitor lock is an intrinsic part of the Java virtual machine. Another way we can actually um, implement this is using atomic variables. Here's an example of a, an atomic integer. There's a range of these in the collection classes that you can exploit. Um, the beauty of atomic integers is that you don't have to worry about the synchronization yourself. So here in this very simple example, we have a class called shared variable. Its single member is an atomic integer. So we create our new atomic integer. And then when we do an increment, this method, as you'll probably know, and this method are not synchronized. So the calling method, the calling objects will not block on here. Um, they'll actually execute this method. But what happens is this atomic integer actually is essentially a serialized, access to the atomic integer is serialized. So that if we get multiple threads in here trying to call val dot get an increment, then they will block on this statement because atomic integer is safe. It has synchronized methods essentially. So this just simplifies your code. You're delegating the responsibility for the critical section handling down to a, a, a class which is defined in, in the Java collection classes. So it's just a, a nice way of simplifying your code. Another very useful um, way to synchronize threads is called barrier synchronization. And this, you've sort of seen this earlier with our naming thread example, where we want a lot of threads to complete before the main completes. What you can think of is that there's a number of threads. We don't know when they're going to complete. They all sort of have independent execution times. But we want to only continue to execute, say, in the main thread, when all of the threads have reached a particular point. This particular point is known as a barrier. So all the threads reach the same point, and then we can continue. So barriers are, in, there's a couple of ways of doing this in Java. Um, one we'll show here is a countdown latch and implements a barrier. Basically, you have initialize a countdown latch with a count. And the count is typically the number of threads that you want to wait for until you continue. So you imagine the main thread might want to wait for 10 different threads. So it initializes a barrier with the value 10. And then basically the main thread might block and it does this by calling the await method. And the await method will block until the count of the barrier is zero. Each thread that we're waiting for must therefore execute the countdown method. And countdown decrements the barrier value. And when this value reaches zero, the await returns. So the, the thread or threads which are waiting for the, the, uh, the other threads to reach the same point will then be 
woken up and continue execution. So this is a one-shot phenomenon, just re-initialize the barrier and it can't be reset. And there's something called a cyclic barrier, which you can actually initialize multiple times. So sometimes that's more convenient, it depends exactly what you're trying to do. Here's an example. It's uh, basically the same example we had earlier, our request counter, but we've now put a barrier in it. So here we have our increment method, which we are calling in all our threads here. So we go around, we create our thousand threads in this example, and we initialize the countdown latch to 1000. And in each thread, in its run method, we increment the counter and we call countdown. So every thread will call countdown. The main thread will not continue until the countdown latch has reached zero. And we can ensure this because we make sure it waits here. So the main thread creates all the threads. They all execute asynchronously. So they may or may not have completed by the time the main thread gets to here. But by the time this method returns, we know all of the threads have executed a countdown and hence must have completed. So that's just a very simple example of a barrier synchronization using a countdown latch, which uh, comes in pretty handy normally in this course. Okay, so that's race conditions and synchronization methods to eradicate race conditions. Next, we're going to look at more thread coordination issues and how we can uh, solve problems called deadlocks.